Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. When people say nice things about me, it doesn't happen every day or even every month, I often say, gosh, I wish my mother were here. <laughs> and my mother is here. So this is really a special joy. And it is a joy to be back here at Columbia for all the reasons David mentioned, uh, so many family connections. Uh, and my grandfather's daughter, my Aunt Isabel, is here and her husband Gavin, so hello and uh, welcome to both of you. I was tempted because I had so much fun last year um, and some of you were here and I was thinking about this fall and being at Columbia and I was tempted to, as I look at three and a half months left in what will be my three and a half years serving as the ambassador in the UK and to be here at Columbia, I thought, well, this is fun. I mean, we could go back to the sort of special relationship, you know, FDR with his Columbia Law School connections and go all the way up to the current administration and Barack Obama and his Columbia connections, and we could kind of focus on that bit. Or we could go way, way back to the awkward 1776 and all that and King's College into Columbia College and embrace the awkwardness of that uh, and then think about a certain Alexander Hamilton who has kind of, you know, come to life uh, in, in, in the minds of lots of us, including lots of young people, because of what Lin-Manuel Miranda has done, which, by the way, he just showed up in London, so he's now casting the London version of Hamilton. So, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that because I don't know how you all are feeling, but I am feeling a sense of unease about what's happening on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, now it is true that, and President Obama does remind us, that statistically speaking there is no better time to be alive than right now. Right, in the sense that if you were to pick any time to be alive and you couldn't pick where you were born or to whom you were born, you would pick now because you're most likely to live beyond infancy, you're most likely to live something like a full life in something either free or close to free. So that's all true and the, and the, the data backs it up and yet we don't live statistically, so it doesn't, it's not actually much comfort, I don't think. Um, and you look at it and you think, you know, sort of both sides of the political aisle, on both sides of the Atlantic, people are really questioning the motivations and the actions of leaders of public institutions and private institutions. And they're even questioning the value of these systems that the U.S. and the U.K., these international rules-based systems that the U.S. and the U.K. have built up since the time of Sir Winston and FDR over these last seven decades. People seem to be sort of talking at each other, talking past each other, and there seems to be this gulf that's growing. And so I think about that, um, and I ask myself, well, where did this come from, and how might each of us do something about it? And that's what I wanted to share what I've been thinking about and then open it up for your suggestions and insights. Sound good? Okay. Um, so where did, we, where did this all come from? And I, I was, one of the great parts of this job in London is we get all these amazing visitors from the United States government coming through London. We have a term of art for this. It's called visit nights. So we just completed our fiscal year, September 30th. We had 24,000 visit nights last year through the London Embassy. So picture an army general and her four staff spending two nights, that's 10 visit nights. We had 24,000 um, and it's amazing. Uh, and one of these people um, I had a meeting with, he's a law, law enforcement professional. And I would like to say that it was you know, a day before my meeting, I was reading up on my memo, but truth be told, it was five minutes before the meeting and I'm flipping through the memo about who is this guy and why am I meeting with him, and I read his bio, his CV, and it's really impressive. And the thing he had done right before his current job was he was the guy, one of the many people sent in by the Justice Department into communities where the trust between law enforcement and the communities have so tragically broken down. Right, so you can think Ferguson, Missouri, but you know that's not the only community that has been uh, wrestling with this. So, I asked him a question, and we'll talk later about what I've learned from all these young people in the UK, but police brutality is a major concern of British young people about what's happening in our country. So I asked him, 
you know, how he did his work and what he learned. And he told me this story and he said, well, every place I go, I do two things right when I get to town. And step one is I get a group, basically the size of tonight's group, from all over the community, a diverse sort of um, group of people, and I put one word up on the PowerPoint. No, 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 not, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, you can have to use your imagination for this one. And then he asked them all to think of the first word that pops into their mind. And, and we're not going to play the game, but think what it would be for you. And the word is housekeeper. Got it? Housekeeper. So he puts up the word housekeeper, and, and then he, get, he gets people to share. Like, you know, Nancy, what were you thinking? And Bob, what were you thinking? And he does this, and you'd expect, you get 100 people in a room, you get, you know, 50 to 100 different answers. Some people write down their mother because she worked as a housekeeper to put them through college, or promotion because they wish they'd get one so they could hire a housekeeper once a month, or they might write Downton Abbey, or they might write hard work, or they might write a certain immigrant group that had arrived in that town or city that was disproportionately um, taking those sorts of jobs to integrate into the economy. So anyway, a wide variety of responses, that's part one. Part two, he goes and gets his fellow law enforcement, the police men and women from that community, gets them all in a room, same thing, housekeeper, and guess what he tells me? They nearly all write the exact same word. Thief. And I had the same reaction to, I heard from many, I was like, what? And he said, yeah, he said, well, think about it. These men and women are perfectly curious and smart like, like everyone else. They just generally grew up in families that didn't have enough money to hire a housekeeper. And they don't get paid enough to hire a housekeeper. So the only housekeepers they ever meet are people they meet on the job who are accused of or guilty of stealing something. Right? And we know the lingo. I mean, the lingo, and it's in the news these days, um, is uh, implicit bias. Right? And, th and that is something that is really important. So he said that, and, and then we got on to the actual business of the meeting. But I reflected on that, and I thought, okay, well, what are the words that I am using as a diplomat that I think, and my fellow people and many here in the room, who are committed to international relations, whether you're in business or academia or government, and I say these things all the time. Here are some examples. Uh, international rules-based order. Intellectual property protection. Um, free trade and investment deals. I mean, I must say those things, you know, a hundred times a day. And I think they're benign or neutral or helpful, like housekeeper. And clearly, a whole bunch of people on, in this country and back in the United Kingdom hear those words and they think thief. And then the other thing I've reflected on is, what are the words that other people are saying to me and my fellow diplomats or people who care about uh, the transatlantic relationship, they mean them in a kind of benign to neutral way, except we're hearing them as thief and we feel our arms start folding and our fists start clenching and our fingers start pointing. What are those hot buttons people are pushing with their words with us that we don't even realize? And so how might we do something about that? And for me, it is a really simple bit of advice which was given to me right after I left the internet business and was about to go serve as a diplomat in Sweden. And I got a chance to be with President Obama. He just got elected. I got to go into the Oval Office uh, before I left. And I really only had one question I wanted to ask him. So we chit-chatted for a little bit and then we sat down. The chairs were like this, a different material. They weren't sort of lucite, but we sat down and I just said it. I said, Mr. President, what advice would you have for me as a first-time ambassador? And I remember it like it was yesterday. He looked up at the ceiling, he thought for a moment, and he said, well, Matthew, listen. And I already had my pen out at that point, and uh, I thought to myself, and did not say, yes, Mr. President, why do you think I came all this way from Kentucky? I was planning to listen. And I had my black book, and I just sat there. And that's all he said. And you guys are quicker than I was. It was a long, awkward pause <laughs> as I sat there. And of course, he wasn't saying, listen to all my pearls of wisdom. He was just saying, listen, just listen. So I tried to do that in Sweden, and I tried to do that in the United Kingdom. And one group I really wanted to focus on was people under 18. Because, I mean, quite technically, the cliche, I mean, they are the future of this special relationship. They don't have fond memories of, you know, World War II is a long, long time ago. Um, you can call them the 9-11 generation. They were four when that happened. So it's not like that was a visceral 
thing like it is for many of us in this room. Um, so I went around and I met with over 18,000 18 year olds and I do, a, I do, I don't call it art therapy because they would be creeped out by that, but it's kind of what it is. I give them a blank piece of paper and a pencil and I say, please draw me a picture of something that frustrates, concerns, or confuses you about the United States. And if you don't want to draw a picture, you can write a word. And they do that, or a cartoon, and they do that. And then I, flip, I say, flip it over, draw a picture, or write a word of something that inspires, gives you hope, or you like about the United States. And I just want to share with you quickly what they wrote. Now, if you go to a college campus like Columbia or Oxford or UCL or King's College or Newcastle University and you show up and you're the American ambassador, you will get a bunch of really bright international relations poli-sci students and teachers and they will, I've played the game with them too, you will hear things like Guantanamo Bay, surveillance, Israel-Palestine, our support of Israel, war, oil, that kind of thing. And that absolutely comes up at these sessions that I do. Thank you. And I've put in blue here foreign policy and in red, can you guys see it over there? In red I put things we would as Americans think of as domestic policy and as you can see the domestic policy issues far, far outweigh So that's after 18,000. And we spend the bulk of our time talking about that. And at the end, we save a little time for what I call the happy bit, which is what do you like, what gives you hope, what you inspire. And I think things like freedom you would sort of expect, things like food I wouldn't have, but um, <laughs> sports, TV, things you can touch, things you can't touch, conceptual things, tac tactile things. <laughs> We'll leave that one up. It's a happy one. We'll let that remain the backdrop here for a second. Um, so I was, uh, the New York Times wrote a story about this work when I had gotten to the 100 high school mark. And someone in the British government read it and very kindly invited me to come talk to a group of sort of uh, diplomats and policy makers in the UK. And I presented a, like a deep version of this, like this stuff plus a whole bunch of data about what I had learned. Um, and as I'm giving the pitch, and I, I think it's kind of, I, mean, I love it, and I think it's neat, there's a guy sitting in the front row who is slightly too polite to just go like this. <laughs> but I mean, this guy is hating it. Hating it. So it comes time, I open it up for, for questions, and this guy, and I'm not picking on Adam, but he was sitting like right there where Adam is. And so he raises his hand. I thought, okay, great, I'll call on this guy. So I said, yes. And he says, uh, what do all those pretty pictures have to do with policy? And then he went on. And he, it wasn't a question. You know, it, was, it was a whole bunch of, hey, that's fine. Um, what are those things? And he's like, you know, I, talk, I told the listening story about President Obama. He's like, listening, everyone listens. I mean, big deal. Listening is like motherhood and apple pie. And I am not one of those people who is able to, in the moment, come up with the quick and clever thing to say. It's a wonderful skill. I don't have it. So I got really defensive. And I gave a pretty lame answer. And I'm not going to bore you with the lame answer, but I felt my voice go up like three levels. And I was like, no, 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 this isn't policy. This is, this is um, engagement or some buzzword. Um, I do policy. Of course I do policy. Look what we're doing on Russia, Ukraine. Look what we're doing on countering ISIL. Look what we're doing on Ebola. Um, look what we're doing on climate change. And I started to just do the sort of laundry list of things that the US and the UK do together around the world. He was unimpressed by the answer. And it has bugged me ever since because I think he actually asked the right question. I just gave the wrong answer. And as I've reflected on it, I think some of the seeds of the right answer were in his question. Motherhood and apple pie. I mean, motherhood, for starters, and I'm not just saying it because my mom's here. I mean, skipping over motherhood and taking that for granted seems silly because quite literally none of us would be here without motherhood. But I won't dwell on motherhood. Um, 
apple pie. Now my little brother got married recently and his best friend stood up and gave a toast. And I'll never forget it. And here's what he said. He told a story of when they were younger and uh, they were actually having, uh, trying to impress the grown-ups, including my aunt and uncle here and a whole bunch of grown-ups. They were going to cook dinner for the grown-ups. Um, and his best friend Jay, who was giving the toast, knew how to cook a little bit. My little brother Charles really did not. And his friend Jay says, we're cooking apple pie. And Charles looks like, ah, I don't know. And he's like, I'm not so sure. And his friend assures him, it's okay, Charles. It's simple. So they get to work and they're chopping apples and they're peeling apples and they're chopping apples and they're peeling apples. The grown-ups are coming, the clock keeps moving and dinner is about to be served and the apple pie is still in peeling and cutting mode. And so my brother turns to his best friend and says, Jay, exasperated, Jay, you told me this would be easy. And his friend Jay shot back, no, I didn't. I said it would be simple. <laughs> and it is. It is simple and hard and time-consuming and repetitive and meaningful just like marriage <laughs> right just like marriage and I would add just like motherhood just like fatherhood just like listening and just like diplomacy so my answer I wish I could have given to that guy that day is sir listening is policy listening is policy and it works. And I've seen it work. And if you listen, people hear you differently. And I've seen this on the political campaign where you see those great images of Barack Hussein Obama in 2007 talking to 12 people in an Iowa cornfield. And then you fast forward to him talking to 2 million people on the mall. And yes, it's true that he's an amazing speaker, but I was there in those cornfields in Iowa and it wasn't him giving some soaring oration. It was him listening to the concerns of those people in Iowa, really listening, and asking them for help so that he could try to go do something about it. And then I've seen, once he got into office, whether it's beginning to normalize relations with Cuba, whether it's trying to get 196 countries together on climate change, or whether it is the Iran nuclear deal, which he identified was the number one security threat to our country, through a lot of back channel at first and then official negotiations and lots of listening involved in that led to the Iran nuclear deal without a single shot being fired or a single troop getting deployed. So I think it really works and all of that listening whether on the foreign policy or the political front is hard. You know what I think is not hard? What is in fact easy? Building walls. I just, my lovely wife and uh, three children just moved back from London so I had to help pack up the stuff and our youngest son has tons of Legos and I remember just looking at this big drawer putting it into a box and I thought to myself if we were to give everyone here in this room a box, a, you know, a pile of Legos and say we're coming back in 30 seconds quick, build a bridge or build a wall, same score for each, what would you build? You probably build a wall. I mean, anyone can do that. You just stand in one place and you start stacking. Building bridges, it's easy to say as a diplomat. It's actually hard to do. And I think it takes three things to build a wall. I'm sorry, three things to build a bridge. First, you have to see yourself. You have to know where you stand and what you stand for. And then, you have to do the second thing. You have to see the other. Not just tolerate the other, but really see them and acknowledge the other. And then you have to do this third thing. And those first two things are hard enough. You have to actually see yourself in the other. You have to kind of explore the other shore. And that's what I've been reflecting on. And I think each of us in our own way needs to find ways to see yourself, see the other, see yourself in the other, it is as hard and as simple as that. And with that, I would love to take President Obama's advice to heart in this moment and listen to your observations and your suggestions. Thank you.